first time here on the last Wednesday of the month, you might be finding out that on the last Wednesday of every month, we bring you Astrology Night. Uh, this is a, a taste for our favorite astrologer to give us a, a monthly preview of what's coming up in September. And uh, it's one of our most well-attended events, and thousands and thousands and thousands of people wind up watching this broadcast and recording online, so, so you're in good company. So uh, without further ado, let's welcome Rizalini to the stage for Wednesday. So these eclipse, am I on? Yeah. These eclipse classes are great, except I can't see a goddamn thing. <laughs> oh, but I see an eclipse. So welcome to Soul Food Coffee House in Redmond, Washington. This is the last Wednesday of the month, the month being August of 2017, meaning that we have September of 2017 in front of us to talk about. Um, I uh, assume that most of us uh, uh, survived the eclipse. As I said before, we started rolling the camera for the uh, YouTube version of this. Uh, I was privileged to be amongst a small group of people and uh, got to watch it unfold. It was actually my second total eclipse and my first total eclipse was at an astrology conference in Plymouth, England. It was in August of 1999 and the eclipse just touched the southernmost part of Plymouth and Cornwall um, in the UK. And I was with a group of about 200 astrologers at a conference that I was speaking at and it was cloudy. And Rob Hand, who is one of the gurus, living uh, treasures of astrology, um, I call Rob the academic dean of astrology on the planet, um, Rob um, decided that about five minutes, ten minutes before totality, we were all gathered on a hill on a, on a grassy knoll um, just on the edge of downtown Plymouth, and Rob decided that he would do an incantation in Latin um, that was an incantation to Mercury, who is the god of change, the you know kind of whimsical um, planet, and do an incantation to Mercury to make the clouds go away. Now the clouds didn't go away, but it was pretty damn cool. <laughs> Anyhow, um, on my Facebook page, which is um, facebook.com, Rick Levine Astrologer, facebook.com slash Rick Levine Astrologer. There is a half hour video that I did a few days before the eclipse as a live Facebook feed. And it kind of went weirdly viral. It's had well over 100,000 hits. And it was a fairly concise um, review and analysis of the eclipse, a little bit of which I talked about last month when we were here, and, um, and, and I just mentioned that in passing for any of you who didn't see it or weren't here last month and want to get a, an astrological review of the eclipse. Remember, astrologically eclipses weird out time, and often the impact of the eclipse lasts for weeks or months afterwards, up to six months after the eclipse, until the next eclipse occurs, eclipses occur uh, roughly six months apart. Now, some of what we'll be talking about tonight will be the reactivation of those eclipse points through the beginning of September. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but that'll be one of the first places where we begin um, tonight's talk. But I just want to remind us that when eclipses occur, these are often, a uh, often accompanying uh, national disaster, national, that, the word national, delete that. <laughs> Disasters, natural, that's the word I was, my brain was going for. Uh, natural disasters. Um, there's a, a shifting of the energy at eclipses that to me are, operate a little bit like the planet Uranus. For those of you who have either listened to my monthly talks or have um, been here before or have heard me talk about the planet um, Uranus, um, actually I did a, a lecture on Uranus 
in Costa Rica, and we have a couple of people who have come here from Denver uh, who are at the Costa Rica event. Welcome, guys. Thank you. Uh, but, when I, but one of the things about Uranus, the planet Uranus, is that it operates like lightning. And the job of lightning is to release built-up tension, even if you didn't know the tension was there. That's, it's like, it, it works electrically, it's like a spark that goes and the lights go on. So often Uranus, which is called the Great Awakener, or the planet of awareness, Uranus often brings things into the light. So eclipses, to me, operate on a Uranian basis, in as much as they, they actually, like, they're almost like someone's flipping the light switch on and off. And it kind of like puts us into another state. Um, uh, it's like we wake up and things are brought into awareness. This eclipse on August 21st, now um, about a week ago, um, and tonight is being the last Wednesday of the night, is August 30th? 29th? 30th. 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 Thank you guys. So this past eclipse also had planets that were harmonizing with um, the, the eclipse was harmonizing with the planet Uranus, which in a way even made that more so. Now we fast forward, and we're not yet to the point at where the eclipse is going to be reactivated on many astrological levels, but we're still within the range of just being within a week or so of the eclipse, and we have what's being called the storm of the century, or the storm of the millennium, whatever you want to call it, the fact is that it's not every day or every year or even every decade or apparently even every century when 50 inches of rain falls all of a sudden. <clears throat> when it rains that much water, as it is right now in Houston, there's a, this is um, about the sun and the moon. This is a lunar event. Why? Because the sun and the moon together create tides. Even though we think of tides as the rising and falling of the seas, the fact of the matter is that these seas in the Gulf of Mexico rose so high that several trillion tons of water rose into the air. There's a different way of looking at it. This is not just a storm. This is a tidal impact. This is like a high tide, which is around new moons and full moons. And again, we you know, understand that even though Houston is being deluged right now by this storm of low pressure, bringing the water up into the air and dropping it over Houston, that this storm has been developing for weeks. And maybe it's only in the past four, five, or six days that it began to intensify. Now, while we're talking, and my point about all of this it, and I don't want to belabor it, is that this is an eclipse event. We can talk about earthquakes, we can talk about storms, um, but this is, in effect, um, related to the eclipse in some way or another. I also want to say that this evening I googled flood, um, flood nine, uh, 2017. And my Google is set up so that it comes back with 100 responses, uh, which you can customize. And I just scrolled through them really quickly, and there were 100 responses about the floods going on in Houston. Does anybody know about the other floods going on right now? That, that in Houston, the, the death toll will probably rise. But in northern India, across the tier of northern India, from Mumbai all the way across to the, 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 Beng, is it the Gulf of Bengal, the, by Pakistan, on the, on the eastern side of India, that they've had an incredible storm. In fact, right now, Mumbai, which is a huge city, is also, like Houston, basically shut down because of its flooding. And I went back and I then Googled, um, I Googled flood 2017 Mumbai, and I got a whole different perspective on the world. I'm saying this because we can get very weird perspectives based upon how news is fed back to us. 
I'm not making any less of the disaster that's going on right now in Houston. Um, I mean, this is, um, uh, it's an event of cosmic proportion, and it's more than just a rainstorm, you know, in, in Houston. Uh, the city is being altered, people's lives are being altered, um, it's, not a, it's not a pretty picture, and my heart goes out to these people. On the other hand, my heart also goes out to the people in India. There have been over a thousand deaths in, in the Indian flooding so far. Um, and I'm not saying it's worse than, I'm not trying to compare the two, I'm just saying that a human life is a human life regardless of what nation one comes from. And we are in this weird place where we kind of get information fed back to us that isn't necessarily the complete picture. So, um, with no further ado, um, this is a chart for right now, uh, or for this afternoon, and we will cycle through this as we talk about the month of September coming up. But I just want to start off just talking about this little cluster right down here. Uh, we had the new moon eclipse, the total eclipse of the sun, on August 21st. And this total eclipse, the path went across the United States. And of course the um, hurricane uh, Harvey um, is occurring obviously in the United States. It's not on the path of totality but from the very northernmost to the very southernmost part of the United States, there was some, um, some of the eclipse was, was visible, even if not total. Um, so the thing to understand is that the eclipse energizes a point. Let's back this up just uh, uh, back to the 21st for a quick moment. And we can see that, that on the 21st, that the sun and the moon were lined up, this is actually um, a few hours after the eclipse, but the sun and the moon were lined up at 28 degrees of Leo, um, 55, that was actually 55 minutes, just about zero degrees, I'm sorry, um, just about 29 degrees of Leo, which is almost zero degrees of Virgo. So we want to hold this point in our mind, this 29 degree point of Leo, um, which is within a degree of the star Regulus, which is one of the Persian fixed stars that had to do with royalty and power um, and the punishing of those who employed revenge. And I talked about this, I think, last month and also on the Eclipse video that I referenced earlier. But the thing to understand that's important here is that this point, this 28 degree, 29 degree point, is, is energized. And every time a planet for the next several months, and certainly for the next week or two, every time a planet goes over that point, that point is activated again. And this is where we need to start our discussion of September. Because we start September with a, um, I want to say it ain't over till it's over. Uh, we start September with a little bit of a cosmic review going on. Why? Because Mercury is retrograde. Mercury is retrograde. I sometimes say it's wretched great. <laughs> Mercury is retrograde. Mercury turned retrograde on August 12th, and it turns direct on September 5th. We're at the tail end of this remedial period. And what happened here from the eclipse is that Mercury, which had already turned retrograde, was up to, um, was in, uh, was in, let me just back this up even further, back to the 12th, where Mercury turns retrograde. Mercury was, was way ahead of the sun at 11 degrees of Virgo. And then Mercury turns retrograde, it backs up to 10 Virgo um, on August 17th, 9, 8. It's now moving pretty quickly. It backs up to 6 degrees on the, tw on the 23rd. This is the day after the eclipse. Mercury is retrograding back toward, excuse me, back toward the sun, while the sun has moved from Leo 
into Virgo, and we'll talk about the change of this energy, the Leo energy and the Virgo energy in just a moment, but we have that Sun moving into Virgo and Mercury backing into the Sun, while Mars is moving forward also. So I want you to watch the Mercury and the Mars as Mercury retrogrades here, the 23rd, uh, 24th, 25th, there's Mercury, Mercury lined up with the Sun on August 26th, and now Mercury at one degree, it's still retrograde, now it's August 30th, and on September 1st, Mercury retrogrades on August 30th, right into September 1st, Mercury retrogrades back into Leo. Can you see, can you see where that happened? Mercury, which had been in Virgo, retrogrades back into Leo. 29 degrees of Leo, Mars is at 27 degrees of Leo, Mars is moving direct on its way to Virgo, Mercury is still moving retrograde until September 5th, that's for another, almost another week now. So what happens is that, that Mercury and Mars on September 3rd actually join up at 28 degrees of Leo and then some, exactly at the point of the, of the eclipse. Boom, boom. <laughs> boom, boom. Boom, boom. I wish I had um, jaws, sharp music. <laughs> Fade in. Could someone do that music for me? There it is. <laughs> Can we do it as a group? Come on. Yeah. All right, we got we 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 got some serious shark stuff floating around in um, maybe in the Bay of Bengal, uh, maybe in the Arabian Sea, and maybe in the Gulf of Mexico, and maybe in your kitchen sink. <laughs> the deal is here that Mercury retrograding back into Mars. All right, so Mercury is, is about being clever. Mercury is the communicator planet. Mercury is the root of the word mercantile, which has to do with trade. It's that information back and forth, whether that information is in the form of money, goods and services, or conversation. That's back and forth and back and forth. That's Mercury's job. So Mercury, having been in Virgo, where Mercury is at home, it's one of Mercury's two domiciles or home signs, Mercury back now moved back into Leo, Mercury is talking. The information's coming out into the open, because in, Merc uh, in Leo, Mercury basically says things. In Virgo, Mercury's more cautious. Mercury doesn't say quite as much. What it says may be very exacting, very intelligent, and very useful, but it's not quite as verbose. What's the word? Loquacious. <laughs> um, chatty. Um, meanwhile, Mercury in Leo is, okay, dude, STF you. Enough. <laughs> you know, <laughs> done. Shh. But Mercury, bad enough, I don't mean bad enough in Leo, because Mercury in Leo can be um, Cyrano de Bergerac. It's that flowery, magnificent language of, of making a presentation and saying things that, that, that are, are, are very um, uh, in the moment and have that sense of flowery because Leo is flowers, right? That's the summer sun. So we have Mercury in Leo, but Mars, no, and Mars is lining up with Mercury. Mars is the planet of red energy, intensity, fire. Mars is the angry red planet. Mars is the god of war. Mars, the planet, is red. Do you know why? Come on. What, because Upper. why? Upper? Iron. 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 But it's not just iron. It's iron on fire. Do you know what iron on fire is? We have a word for it in our language. It's, it's slow motion fire. It's rust. <laughs> no, this is really important to understand. That rust is burning iron. Uh, oxida someone said oxidation. It's oxi but oxidation is fire. And so iron burns in very slow motion 
and it becomes rust. This is why the angry red planet is red and angry. It's on fire. So, we have Mars, the god of war, um, related to iron. Mars is composed of, of rust or burning iron. Um, and, and, and Mars lining up with Mercury, what does that mean? It, it's action, but it's not just physical action. It's action in movement, in thought, in mercantilism, in the exchange of information. There's a sense of, of, of angry words will be spoken. If, 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 if I was a sun sign astrology writer, oh wait, I am, <laughs> and wrote horoscopes, oh, and I didn't, I would say on the day that Mars lined up with Mercury, I would say angry words may be spoken. Do you see where I'm, where I'm coming from with that? Very straightforward, very simple. And in fact, there's two ways that we can respond to this idea that on September 3rd, angry words will be spoken. Now, we say September 3rd, but it's really all last week, all this week, all next week. Um, I mean, th these aspects, they do not happen in a moment, even though sometimes there's a flash event that happens in a moment. But we look at the, again, I can't escape this for very long ever, it seems, we look at the American political scene and we look at the anger that is being spoken. Um, and, and people don't care what side of what coin you're on, people are angry. There's this, this sense of this, this will come out more. And for those of you who remember last month when I was talking about the eclipse and its connection with Mars, I said, you know, look for, you know, the um, diversionary, um, you know, rumblings of war as we moved toward the end of August. And as horrified as I am as this is playing out, I mean, it's not only about Katrina. There's other Katrina. We'll come back to Katrina in just a moment. Um, Harvey. Um, it's not only about Harvey, but as long as I said the other word, Katrina, in my little bit of research, I realized that everyone is comparing this Harvey event with the Katrina event for two reasons, three reasons. The magnitude of the storms are similar. This may be dropping more water, but the magnitudes of the storm are similar, and there's been nothing in between them quite of the same magnitude. Secondly, they both occurred on the same weekend. Oh, no, actually, Katrina occurred a, a week later. Uh, and Katrina was actually um, a, a late August, and its, and its landfall was, I think, on August 26th or September 1st. Or, doesn't matter. But they're both the end of August, okay? Thirdly, um, what, I, what I realized in reading this, this is a 12-year cycle, because Katrina was in this time of year, August, September of 2005, we're now in 2017. All right, now jump over to my little bit of research that I was doing when I got sidetracked by the floods in India and Mumbai, and something caught my interest. And what caught my interest was that, that Mumbai apparently floods from monsoons often. But the last time that there was a flood that was the magnitude of the floods occurring now, today, now, in Mumbai, were in July of 2005. Jupiter? <laughs> Jupiter? That's, Jupiter is a 12-year cycle. Yeah. And then I realized that in 2005, the other big event that started the year in 2005, it was actually um, Boxers, Boxing Day, it was Christmas morning. Um, actually, was the um, was the Indonesian earthquake tsunami that killed a third of a million people in the course of a few hours. That was also 12 years ago, and in all three instances, meaning in all four instances, Katrina and the Indonesian tsunami, um, the Indian flooding, uh, both in 2005 and now, and the Houston flooding that Jupiter was in all of them in roughly the same place in the sky, it was in Libra. Now, what does that mean? I don't know, I'm an astrologer, I look for patterns, and I just found it interesting that, um, that what we have going on in this side of the world is in a timing um, rhythm similar to what was happening or what is happening in, in India. 
All right, so let's bring this back to, to here and now. And we have on September 3rd, and literally from now, um, now being um, um, August 30th, through September 3rd and for days to follow, we have this energy that is impacting again on the eclipses. Oh, and one other thing about natural disasters and eclipses is the we have forest fires every year. And certainly on the west coast, they can be very terrible. But the number of fires and how bad they are in central Oregon and in British Columbia this year are pretty intense. Um, and I think I started to say or said before the camera started rolling, when I was near Madras, Oregon during the actual um, total eclipse, um, the eclipse was totally awe-inspiring, but as the sun went down that night, watching the hills live, red, on fire was frightening. Yeah. I mean, and, um, and the uh, amount of forests that are being burned are, is, pretty, is pretty amazing, it's pretty unreal. Um, so, here we have the beginning of August, I'm sorry, the beginning of September with Mercury and Mars aligning, that Mercury is retrograde, and, um, and there's one other thing here that is very significant, this is also part of the eclipse, but again, it's not just August 21st this event occurred, because as Mars and Mercury are activating this 28 degree Leo point where the eclipse occurred, they are forming an exact trine to Uranus at 28 degrees of Aries. Now we get the picture. We get the lightning, the, 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 the intensity of the sudden events, one after another, relentless, the release of information. It's like if we thought the waters were flowing fast or the, or, or the storms were great intellectually, mentally, politically, culturally. Six months ago, a year ago, it's like we can't keep up with it right now. It's just, and, and it's going to get even more so over the next week or so um, as Mars and Mercury trying Uranus at the eclipse point. Mars and Uranus have an affinity. The affinity is that they're both very young. They're, they're, they're male, they're, they're forceful. Um, um, you know, we think of Mars as you fight for independence. <laughs> well, Uranus is independence. Uranus is, 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 is the freedom from cause and effect. Think about that. You know, you know the lightning is going to strike, but you don't know when. You don't know where. You know it's coming, but you don't know. You, you, you don't know. It's free to strike whenever and wherever it wants to. And Uranian events is one of the, my favorite lines in astrology literature describing Uranus is, is, is how do you predict the unpredictable? If I say something unpredictable is going to happen around September 2nd or 3rd because Mars is trining Uranus, is that just a stupid cop-out? I mean, because I'm saying that something's going to happen that I couldn't predict, and then if something happens that blows all of our minds, you say, oh, he was right. No, he couldn't predict it. It's <laughs> one of these dilemmas, one of these one of the paradoxes. So, but Mars lined up with Mercury, trining Uranus. I'm going to say, and I don't think you even need to be an astrologer or even need to be very smart to, to, to assume that more truth and more things are going to come out in the open once Congress gets back from its recess in the United States. That the, that the energy is going to pick up kind of crazy again. I mean, we've been, even though there's been stuff happening, you know, everyone's home on, quote unquote, on vacation from Washington, D.C. And, so, um, and so this alignment of the, the anger and the forcefulness and the directness, this again is the god of war lining up with Uranus, the suddenness. I'm not sure that we're, we're through the red zone yet. That's a bad way to say it. I'm not sure we're through the danger um, zone when it comes to diversionary military stuff going on. You know, as, as I'm sure many of you know, um, the, the United States and South Korea have been at war games around North Korea, while North Korea has launched and um, put a, a, a guided missile um, over one of the southern islands of Japan. Now, it wasn't, as far as we know, an act of war, but, there, but, but, but the shit's tense up there, out there. 
And I don't think we're quite through it yet. Um, and I'm not saying that we should all go home and, and you know, worry there are things that happen that we can't do anything about, and there are things that we can do things about, and my suggestion, of course, is always to focus on those areas where you can do something about it. All right, I don't want to, I, I want to move on because we have some other territory to cover, but my, my opening point here about September is that the month of September begins with a solar eclipse that happened on August 21st. <laughs> and that will be with us for a bit because even though Mars continues to move forward and, um, and Mars moves into Virgo on the 5th, there's Mars moving into Virgo, Mercury is slowing down to turn direct after its three weeks of retrograde. So Mercury is just hanging there at the exact point of the eclipse. People are talking, shit's coming out, things are being said. Things are being said that are charged with that weird eclipse energy, that things are flipping in ways that we couldn't have predicted. They're, 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 we're, I'm predicting the unpredictable, in effect. And that Mercury hangs there, and it turns direct on the 5th. And there's something else that happens right at that same point that we'll get to in just a moment. But this period of, of the 5th, when Mars moves into Virgo, Mercury is stationary, ready to turn direct. It turns direct on September 5th, actually in the morning here on the west coast of the, U, uh, um, on the, west coast of the U.S., early in the morning. Um, uh, Mercury turns direct. Mars moves into Virgo. Mars has been in Leo. It's been like out there. Things have been out in the open. Look at what happened in, you know, in, um, in, in uh, um, sh where's my brain? Charlotte, Charlottesville. Um, what's happened there? I mean, this is also all during this eclipse phase. This has all been part of the same phase. And the hidden anger and, and, and that intense energy that is, is, is horrific. Um, that has probably never gone away, but all of a sudden it's in our face. And all of a sudden it's in our face and actually being, you know, enticed. The, the, the flames are being fed. This is part of this eclipse energy also. Now, Merc I'm sorry, Mars moves from Leo into Virgo, and Mars is not as happy in Virgo. Why? Because it can't express as much. And yet what it does it's like a laser beam. All right, think of um, um, Mars in Leo is like the, the show of, 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 of a nuclear weapon going off. This is Mars in Leo. And I'm not saying there can't be positive aspects of Mars in Leo. Uh, like I said earlier, it's the flowery language also. But it's the, it's like something happens and we all see it. We can't miss it. In Virgo, Mars becomes a laser beam. Now here's the thing, if a bomb went off, this is all horrible imagery, if a bomb went off somewhere over there, we would feel it, we would all have the same experience, we would know it. But if a laser beam came through here, uh, you, someone could have a laser beam on them directly, and the other 75 people in this room wouldn't know it. Because unless a laser beam is precisely on its target, nothing happens. This is, this is the criticality of a laser. Lasers are Virgoan because Virgo focuses the energy. It becomes critical. It becomes exacting. These are Virgoan words, exacting. So Mars in Virgo becomes a very tightly aimed, narrow uh, focus on that intensity, energy, anger. Anger isn't always bad. Anger creates a ridge, it creates boundaries, and boundaries are important in order for us to survive. So there's a shift of energy as, as, as uh, Mars, moves into, Mars moves into Virgo. However, at the same time, we have, let me just back up one day here, at the same time, we have the Sun in Virgo, exactly opposite Neptune. Now, it's like you can't make messages astrologically that are quite as contradictory. <laughs> 
Virgo is the laser beam that is tightening, narrowing, and is exacting. It's specific. Virgo is detailed oriented, detail oriented, because it's that narrowing, it's the blinders on the horse, you know, that basically says, this is all I see. Virgo is great at focusing in on the detail and taking care of it. Pisces, on the other hand, is what what's a detail? <laughs> Pisces is the disillusion the 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 the, 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 the dis there's a word. Why can't the dis dissolution. All I could think of was dis illusion, which was not the word I was looking for. I'm having a problem with grabbing the right words tonight. Pisces has to do with the dissolving of boundaries. The planet that is related in modern astrology to Pisces is Neptune. Neptune's job is to dissolve boundaries. Neptune takes about 165 years roughly to go around once. It spends about 14 years in each sign. Right now it's about halfway through its visit to its home sign of Virgo. So, I'm sorry, of Pisces. Mercury is retrograde. I get to blame every mistake I make tonight on Mercury retrograde. Jeff Jauer, my now um, disembodied um, uh, uh, astrology partner, used to say that for, for a few years he worked for Matrix Software that makes astrology software. He was in customer service. And he said they all loved it when Mercury, Mercury went retrograde because people would call up with problems, astrologers, and say, I'm having this problem with my software, but I know it's okay, Mercury's retrograde. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I've basically given myself permission to say all the wrong things. Okay, so so Neptune that Neptune's job is to dissolve the hard edges of reality. Neptune, um, Rob Hand once said, actually wrote in a book. I think it was in Horoscope Symbols a gazillion years ago. He wrote, "It used to be said that Saturn was reality." And Neptune is illusion, whereas now it's apparent that Neptune is reality and Saturn is the illusion there is one. <laughs> this guy's way smarter than I am. Okay. But Neptune's job is to dissolve the illusion of edges so that we become all the same in the cosmic soup. It's why the sign of Pisces and the planet Neptune have to do with compassion. Now we're talking a little bit more about Neptune and Pisces because we're going to be getting in a moment to the full moon on September 6th that is opposite the Virgo, narrowing specific detailed oriented laser beam Virgo sun Opposite the spacey, um, we are all swimming in the sea. Um, I think of uh, George Harrison, Pisces George Harrison, um, who said, "I'm just a Pisces fish swimming in the sea." You know, um, there was a song on one of his, one of his CDs that was, I think, called, I think it might have been called Pisces Fish. I don't remember. Um, some YouTube person will correct me because they always do. Uh, I made the mistake in my Eclipse video talking about actually Neptune um, and, and I said Paul McCartney's lyrics, um, you know, um, I am you as you are me as we are all together, goo 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 -joo. and people jumped all over me because it was not Paul McCartney, it was John Lennon and, and John, wherever you may be, um, uh, you did good, and I'm sorry. <laughs> um, all right, so uh, on the fourth, we have the annual opposition of, of the sun to, to Neptune. You know, the sun moving around the zodiac once a year basically lines up with and is opposite the outer planets every year. And so, um, so the sun is coming into its opposition to Neptune um, on exactly on September 4th. 
And the reason why this is so important is that September 4th, we have the Sun opposition to, to Neptune. On the 5th, Mercury turns direct, Mars moves into Virgo. And then on the 6th, we have... Actually, it's very early on the 6th. Let me get this a little bit more exact. Uh, nope. That sound effects. <laughs> 1351. That's close enough. All right. So, um, in the actual time of the Pisces full moon, it is um, 2:44 uh, a.m. in that specific time. Uh, 2:44 a.m. Very early in the morning on September 6th, we have the Pisces full moon, which basically puts a, a stamp on this conflict between the individual specificity narrowing of reality and the compassion that we feel as we move from Virgo to Pisces because, you see, it's not that Virgo doesn't have any sense of compassion, but in Pisces, if there's no difference between you and me and you're hurting, then I'm hurting. And so this full moon in Pisces is very much, it's very compassionate. The problem with Pisces and with this full moon in Pisces is that it's not just another every year there's a full moon in Pisces. This full moon in Pisces is occurring lined up with, the, with, with um, Neptune, who's um, basically the planet that hums Pisces energy. It's one of them. Jupiter may be. Um, and we're not going there right now. But, but what that means is that it's only for 13 or 14 years out of every 165 years that Pisces is in its home sign. And this full moon is lined up with Neptune. This is like a full moon on Pisces on steroids. It's, it's like crazy out of control. And what is, I mean, Pisces is a water sign, but it's the water is diffusive. It's water that's not contained by the tide wall. There's a wonderful book by Lyle Watson. Does anyone know Lyle Watson? Hands? Oh, come on, guys. Okay, we, we all promise me that you'll Google him and, and read one of his 15 amazing books. The, whatever the titles are, the one that strikes you. Um, I mean, he wrote books like Supernature and The Secret Life of Inanimate Objects. Um, and he wrote a book called Heaven's Breath, A Natural History of the Wind. He was, he, he was a um, British, um, actually I think he was Welsh, um, but um, an academic who was an anthropologist, biologist, anthropologist, and he wrote a book called The Dreams of Dragons. Just a brilliant writer. Well, the book that I'm thinking of is a book called Life Tide which is a mind bender. It's a, it's, it's, you, you can't read Lyle Watson and feel like you're straight. It has nothing to do with doing any, any substances. Um, but, but the book Life Tide, he, he talks about how the, the tide every month goes up and down. And every now and then there are tides that are stronger than other tides, and we call them spring tides. Uh, they don't only occur in the spring, but they're spring tides that actually are so great that they kind of um, can go over the tide wall. He says that we are at a point in time in nature when consciousness is at a spring tide point where it's actually overflowing the tide walls that create the shape of the ocean. And as as the, as the ocean overflows, as it breaches, um, as it's doing in Houston right now, um, as it breaches its normal containers, it's like, even when it goes back, it's never the same. And so what's happening with, with, with this Neptune, uh, with this full moon in Neptune, um, even from a physical standpoint with the waters, with the real physical waters in Neptune, but I'm talking here now also about the um, emotional, spiritual waters of, of Pisces, of Neptune, um, that, that Life Tide, the book Life Tide, 
represented that time, that energy, where the tide walls no longer, Saturn no longer contained Neptune, and, and everything got redefined. And that's what's happening now. Now, the other piece of this full moon that's lined up with Neptune that, that, that pits the focus of the usefulness of knowing what's valid and what's not valid, that's Virgo, it pits that against this idea of cosmic consciousness and we're, we are all one. We are all one. Um, it, it pits these one against another. It's like a culmination of this tension and into that we have this Mercury, Mars, even though Mars has moved into Virgo and is becoming more exacting and more detailed oriented and more refined, it's still harmonized and trine with Uranus and even into this it's widely grand trine with Saturn in Sagittarius. Saturn in Sagittarius, the belief that, that my um, tide wall, my boundaries, my truth is right. And therefore, yours sucks. <laughs> and this is part of the problem that we have going on around the world and certainly in the United States is the problem is not people believing different things. The problem is people believing different things and living in a world now where we can feedback reality to eliminate everything that's not part of our belief so that there's no dialogue. And this is a whole other issue and we're not going there. All right, so um, this full moon is incredibly powerful and we need to move along really quickly. All right, um, on September 9th, the sun in Virgo forms a trine with Pluto. Oh, let me change this back to, let's go back to noon and change this back to a day. All right, so here we have the sun moving into a trine with Pluto. Uh, the intensity, the power builds. Venus is forming a quincunx with Pluto. Um, by the 8th of September, the shit's deeper. It's, it's harder, but we're, we're willing to work with it, but it's not easy because this quincunx from Neptune is basically making whatever our truth is, whatever the reality is, whatever we're uncovering as we're, as, as we're lighting up, <laughs> no, not as we're lighting up, but as we're lighting up the darkness, um, the sun, the radiant, brilliant light of the sun is illuminating the darkness of the underworld, Pluto. And when things are seen, they don't have the power that they had when they were unseen. And meanwhile, that Venus moving through Leo is forming that quincunx, so it's not easy to take. Then we have Mercury, which has been moving direct on September 9th. Mercury moves into Virgo. Uh, right there, it's late on the 9th, so from the 9th to the 10th, Mercury moves into Virgo, and all of a sudden now, the energy is more Virgo in than Leonine. Virgo is, the energy begins to close down. Summer is still summer ring, but it's getting narrower, and it will continue to do that until the equinox, which we will get to in a moment, which is that balance point, and then from that equinox onward, the energy is basically pulling in. Now, you see, in Virgo, the energy is still moving outward, but it's moving outward slower. <laughs> and so there's a feeling of it closing down, although it doesn't actually start to pull back until the equinox. And that's the Virgo being the harvest as all the energy is pulled back into seeds. You know, we harvest the, the wheat when the energy is back in the pulse, back in the seed itself. But if you wait too long, then it goes to seed, the seeds fall, and then they're getting ready to do their magic again the following spring. All right, so we have now Mercury, Mars, and, um, uh, and the Sun all in Virgo. And in fact, Mercury, which is moving, is picking up speed now, going direct, Mercury will catch back up with Mars. Let's just jump this head a few days, because Mercury will catch back up with Mars right there on the 16th, and again, we'll have another replay of this stuff coming out in the open, 
that we did around the eclipse, and we are the first week of September, but now it'll be more specific. It won't be all over the place. It won't be that Leo energy that will be occurring in Virgo. Let's back up again um, because we want to get uh, two other things. We want to pick up on September 12th, we have Venus in Leo forming a harmonious trine with Saturn. This becomes important because that Venus will eventually um, move to the eclipse point. I don't think it gets there, but yeah, it does. Um, Venus um, will get to that point by the, by the 20th. Um, but you see right now Venus is making a harmonious trine to Saturn and eventually uh, that Venus will actually on the 17th, five days later, make the trine to Uranus. Can you see this here? And this fire grand trine, which has been kind of hanging out a bit with the Saturn Uranus, which is not quite done, we began talking about that back last fall, um, and then in May, um, right around when the uh, uh, special counsel, when uh, Mueller was hired, that was Saturn authority Uranus. Um, Trump. And so there was some relationship, some dance there. This dance is far from over, but the fact that Venus harmonizes with Saturn and anchors, it puts a reality check on, on, on emotions, on love, on, on sweetness. Um, and yet it does it in a trying form, so we actually get to work with it. We get to make real commitments that are of value. Um, um, the Venus trying Saturn basically makes us like the idea of waiting for something that's valuable rather than having an experience that will just come and go. It's the delayed gratification, you know, kind of out of maturity. Uh, we move onward watching that Venus. Um, oh, in there we also then have the Sun squaring Saturn. So it's it's interesting because again we have a planet squaring Saturn and one and one. Um, uh, trining it, like earlier in the month we had a planet trining um, Pluto, we had the Sun trining Pluto while um, Venus was quincunxing. Now again we have two planets hitting an aspect. The Sun square planet Saturn is tough. Venus trine Saturn is much easier. The Sun square Saturn, which is exact on September 13th, is a bit of a reality check. This is like hitting the wall. This is about kind of being, figuring out what doesn't work so that we can make it work. This is um, definitely um, a time when, uh, when we have to face the music. And it's not necessarily bad if we've been doing our work. You know, Saturn gives us a hall pass and says you can go. But otherwise, we have to finish what we haven't done yet. Um, moving onward on the 16th, we talked about this already. Uh, that's when Mercury lines up with Mars again. Um, on the 17th, we mentioned that briefly, that's when Venus harmonizes with Uranus. This is a um, uh, Venus, again, love. Venus trying Saturn says, I'll wait to make it real. Venus trying Uranus says, forget waiting, now or never. That, no, it, it likes the different, it likes the, the electric shock of the moment. There's something with Venus trining Uranus that, that, that allows us to step outside of the box. Um, whether we do it in reality or in fantasy, it's certainly a moving outside the box. That's on the 17th. Um, on, the ninth, uh, on the 19th, um, a couple of things. One is that the Sun opposes Chiron. You know, I often set a Chiron to the side, not because it's any less important, but because for general talks like this, there's only so much information that we can integrate in a short amount of time. But there's something here about the annual opposition of Sun to Chiron, the wounded healer, um, to that part of us as every human um, is, is vulnerable and hurts, and this comes into awareness. This is a point at which we can maybe break through some of our stuff by being vulnerable, being open, um, and it's, I think, an important piece of, of the puzzle. On the 19th also, Venus, actually on the 18th, 17th, 18th, 19th, Venus moves over the eclipse point. There it is right there on the 18th. 
and by the 1920th, Venus has moved into Virgo. It kind of completes the move from the outward, manifesting, expressive, party animal um, Leo um, into the let's narrow, focus, do the work, get serious, let's buckle down and do what we need to do. Remember, Virgo is the binary function of the zodiac. Virgo has the ability to say yes or no. Uh, I know I've said, I've talked about this in depth from here before, and I'm not going to right now, but Virgo comes from, very briefly, from the Greek word virgin, which in Greek society had nothing to do with whether a woman had sex or not. It had to do with whether a woman was property or not. And that in the Greek society, there were two classes of virgins. They were the temple priestesses, um, and they were the prostitutes. Prostitutes were vir virgins. Why? because they could say no, just like the temple priestesses. And the temple priestesses were not, when you think of the virgin priestesses, they were not sexless. If you read anything about the Eleusian mysteries and the healings that went on and the rites and the use of a psychedelic substance called kaikion, and I recommend, by the way, a book that's relatively new um, called um, Stealing Fire. It's a brilliant book about um, social changes going on now, but it connects it back to some of the things that were going on during the um, initiations of the rites from the priestesses in Greece, where virgin priestesses would um, basically take males through these amazing um, sexual healing rites that basically turned the person's, the male's head around and put him on a right track. Um, the problem was, from a male point of view, no male could demand it or even request it. And this is what the real meaning of Virgo or Virgin is from the Greek perspective, and that's the binary function, yes, no. We think of Virgo as the critic, as the person who says, mm, that's not right, that's, uh, the deep, that has to, uh, uh, that's perfect, that's, <laughs> that's Virgo. But in fact, Virgo is the ability to say no. And if your property, whether you're a young woman, child who's owned by your father, or whether because of the whole way um, the marriage works that basically someone, you know, that basically you, you pay someone to take your daughter off your hands with a dowry, um, that basically then the, the young girl's new husband is her owner. Because, um, because women historically, at least in the West, actually in the East also, have largely been property. And even though we come, have come a long way, we still associate the idea of, um, of, of virginity, or we do now, with sex, rather than the true meaning in astrology, and that is the ability to say no. And that's what Virgo's job is. And now, by the you know, middle of September, we have this beginning from the absolute beginning of September, but we have planets moving from showy Leo into, um, into Virgo. And it's interesting that Venus enters Virgo on, on the um, 19th, but it is on the, where'd it go? On the 22nd that the Sun moves from Virgo into Libra and that is the um, autumnal equinox in the north and the uh, vernal or spring equinox in, in the south. Um, so this point here, the energy shifts, but there's still something interesting going on through the rest of the month, and that is we talked about the sun's opposition to Neptune, um, the, the polarity of the very small and the very large, the polarity of the very specific critical line of Virgo and the diffused um, fuzziness of dispersive um, uh, Neptune in Pisces. But the Sun does that opposition on September 4th. Mercury does that opposition on the 19th. Mars does that opposition on the 24th. And Venus does that opposition on the 29th. So we have here a very important repetitive theme that if you just look at the planets and their aspects, you would miss the fact that so much of the month of September is about what do we focus on locally versus what do we know about universally. That's the difference between the 
Virgo and the Pisces axis. With the Sun, it's awareness. With Mercury, it's intellect. With Mars, it's energy and what do we do. And with Venus, it's what are we attracted to, what do we like, what are our values. But this becomes an important theme of, of the month. Um, and the Mars opposition to Neptune on the 24th um, is part of that flow of, of that larger flow of events. Um, we skipped over and we're going to back up and then we're going to summarize. We're going to back up to the new moon in Virgo. There, that's close enough. The new moon in Virgo, which is on which is on September 19th um, at 10:29, um, 10:30 p.m. here on the west coast of the United States. That's 10:30, 11:30, 12:30, 1:30 a.m. on September 20th on the east coast. Um, but this new moon in Virgo is the beginning of the next cycle, and yet it's interesting because it happens so late in Virgo that it's only a few hours later when the moon moves into Libra and then a couple days later when the sun moves into Libra. So it's almost like we're, get, we're leaving a phase. I don't know exactly how this will work, but, but it'll be difficult to put our finger on it while we're there. Why? Because on the day of the new moon, Mercury is opposite Neptune. We're not going to be seeing things as clearly as we would like to. And on top of that, we have um, Venus, which has moved into Virgo, is now forming that harmonious trine with Uranus. And so there is this sense of, of kind of wanting to shift things around, wanting to make the changes that perhaps we've been talking about or thinking about. And yet this new moon, even though um, Venus is harmonized with Uranus, we have the new moon that is quincunx Uranus, I'm sorry, Venus is harmonized with Uranus. Then the new moon is is annoyed by Uranus. It's like Uranus, it's, it's like it's like all this new information and, and the stuff is happening so quickly, it's like we're we're not comfortable with it. We're not comfortable with it. And um, and and then into that and the importance of Uranus this month cannot be overstated because of one other piece. And that is that on September 27th, see, do we need to cover anything in between? Um, yeah, Mercury square Saturn on the 25th, that's another Saturn square. You know, all these planets as they're moving through late Virgo are squaring Saturn, even including the, the new moon, and that's having to deal with reality. So we go back here to a day at a time, we move this forward, and we get, um, on, we, we get, uh, where did we go here? Mercury squaring Saturn on the 25th. Um, no, we're not there yet. Mercury squaring Saturn on the 25th. And again, this is a reality check. It's back to the drawing boards. Get, thing get things down. Do them right. But this is building to what may be the most important aspect of the month. And, you know, the slower moving the planets, the longer lasting the aspect and the more important the aspect is over time. And on September 27th, on September 27th, we have Jupiter, 27 degrees, 22, 23 minutes of Libra, opposite Uranus at 27 degrees, 22 minutes of, of Aries. Now, Jupiter has gone <coughs> over this point retrograded back over it, and now it's going direct. It's actually heading towards Scorpio. Um, but at the latter degrees, um, it moves into Scorpio, I think, in October. Uh, but I'm not allowed to talk about that because that's next month. Um, but this exact aspect of Jupiter opposition Uranus was exact on December 26th. Uh, that's last year, on this, uh, 2016. Jupiter was opposed Uranus then, and then it opposed Uranus as it was going retrograde, as Jupiter was going retrograde on March 2nd, and now on September 27th that Jupiter will oppose Uranus for the third and final time. I wrote an article for the Mountain Astrologer a couple of years ago on this cycle 
of Uranus, um, of Jupiter Uranus, the Jupiter opposition to Uranus, and talked about, I traced it back a couple hundred years, it's in every 13, 13, 14, roughly every 14 year cycle. Um, because Jupiter takes 12 years to go around once, and by then Uranus has moved a little bit further, so it takes a year or so for, or two for, for Jupiter to catch back up to Uranus. The Uranus-Jupiter cycle conjunction opposition, um, the, the Jupiter um, opposition is always tied to technological breakthroughs, changes of awareness, of consciousness, and this has certainly been going on for us, but, it's, but it has that Uranian lightning-like thing that brings stuff out into awareness, into the open. Um, I think in our, on, on the cultural level, this does have a little bit to do with the awareness of the origins of the United States and how, um, and how the history has been contorted isn't quite over, so to speak. Um, whether we talk about white supremacy, neo-Nazism, neo Nazism, anti-Semitism, anti-Latinoism, um, uh, xenophobia, um, what, the, that, all those things and more, I think that part of that is coming into awareness because Uranus, the planet of lightning striking and awakening and, and sudden change, is being activated in relationship by Jupiter, the planet of more. Bigger, better, and more. Now, bigger isn't always better. Um, I like to all quote Mae West, who once said something like, too much of a good thing is a good thing. And, but it's not. Um, ask anyone who's ever suffered with cancer. I mean, I'm not saying that Jupiter is cancer. I mean, you know, I mean the disease, not the, not the sign. But, but, but a cancer cell is a, is a cell that is getting bigger and bigger by multiplication without Saturn controlling it. So too much of a good thing is not a good thing. But when Jupiter opposes Uranus, there's often technological breakthroughs, there's often changes in awareness, and there certainly is shifts. And I think that in some way, although we're still in the middle of it, it won't be until October, November, December, until Jupiter moves on, that we'll be able to look back and go, what was that Jupiter opposition Uranus really about? I think in some ways it was a flowering of a very bad, a toxic flowering, perhaps. Um, so we will see where that goes and, and how that unfolds. One last thing to say, and that is that outer planets, all real planets go retrograde. We often think of Mercury um, as, you know, because it's the fastest moving and when it goes retrograde it's abrupt and so we notice it. And of course uh, Mercury going direct um, on September 5th really does flavor a lot of this month in September. We're going to be feeling like we're moving forward again. It'll take a week or so for that Mercury to gain speed and to kind of push into new territory. Um, but the outer planets turn retrograde also. And typically, the outer planets are retrograde when they're within a third of a circle, within a trine, on the same, uh, on the same side of the sun as the Earth. Now, when a planet is on the same side, an outer planet is on the same side of the sun as the Earth, it shows up as an opposition. Here's how that works. Um, let's talk about Pluto. If Pluto is on the same side of the sun as the Earth, you have the sun in the center, then you have Earth, and then way out there you have Pluto. If you're on Earth, the sun and Pluto are in opposite directions. So when you have an outer planet that is opposite the sun, within a third of a circle roughly, that planet is always retrograde. And so on September 28th, Pluto, which had been retrograde, now turns direct. Here's the sun, and you see, so what's happening is that the sun is moving this way, but, but if we went back three months ago, three months ago, the sun was exactly opposite Pluto. The sun now moving toward Libra, three months ago, the sun was opposite Pluto. When the, when, when the outer planet is opposite the sun, it's retrograde, because it's on the same side of the Earth as the sun. Now, as the sun 
from an astrological zodiacal perspective is getting closer to Pluto. Pluto changes from retrograde. It's been retrograde for about five months. And these planets move very slowly, so we don't, can't really tell the moment it turns retrograde. And yet, there's a deep, it's like in homeopathy, sometimes the less amount of, of a substance, the deeper the ramifications are of the changes. And so we have Pluto that's turning direct, and this can be a very powerful, deep rumbling of a change of consciousness that has to do with the awareness of what it is that's been <coughs> hidden. Pluto is the lord of the underworld, the subconscious, the unknown, that part of the cycle that's mysterious because it's after death and before birth. It's, it's that which is hidden. So, all in all, this month, you know, it's another rock and roll, but it doesn't have the craziness of last month. Um, but it has uh, some very important things that are following, um, um, wh what is it, um, it, sequitur, in Latin means to follow. We think of a non sequitur as something that doesn't make sense, it doesn't follow. Well, to me, September is a sequitur. There's nothing in September that isn't already set up on some, on some level. And some of it I think will be really healthy even though it may be very stressful as it comes out and especially around the issues of Mars and anger and, I mean, and the difference between what we know and what we don't know, that whole Neptune opposition. But I do think here that, again, the, the thing I'm going to leave you with is something that I've said for years and it comes from, there's a thing that says, um, think globally, act locally. Well, as an astrologer, I like to say, think cosmically, <laughs> act locally. You can think cosmically all you want, and nothing will happen unless you do something in your life. And this is the, what's incumbent on all of us, is to take these grand, general, um, cosmic ideas and somehow turn them into something of value in our individual lives. It's important that we don't get swept up in the waves of anger, hate, and fear. I know I, I feel like a broken record. I've said it again and again and again. Um, but um, go out there, be safe. See you next month. I'm going to put my eclipse glasses back on so that I don't have to deal with any of this crap. <laughs> Thank you. All.